We are live. We are live. Hey, Nisha. Thanks for joining us. We have um, Nisha Thompson, who's from the School of Data Network. She's a fellow who is currently residing in India. And I'm here from Toronto, Canada, in the middle of the night, talking to Nisha. And we're going to do some network mapping training today. So, Nisha, tell us, where are you in India? Thanks, Heather. I am coming from Bangalore, India. And I'm sorry I'm not uh, showing my face, but I want to conserve my broad band width. So I will be sharing my screen momentarily. A little background of myself. I am a School of Data Fellow out of India. I work for an organization called Data Meet. And we are a community of open data enthusiasts who are trying to use data for a civic purpose throughout India. Um, and I'm going to talk about network mapping. Let me just share my screen real quick. Fantastic. There we go. Oops. Network mapping. There we go. All right. Um, so I have also shared some documents here in the uh, Google Drive link on in the chat. And you Thank can get some background documents. Um, that, I, that I have used when I did network mapping uh, several years ago. I have gone back to these. And there is also Heather shared a bunch of new tools at the bottom. So uh, two of these that I go back to fairly often are network-centric advocacy. Um, it's a kind of a short case study in how networks are powerful and how you kind of can move them to do advocacy. And then there's a long handbook. This is about 100 pages of why, why networks, different kinds of networks, terminology, and how to build them. So I want to talk about what is stakeholder mapping. Um, and this is actually a fairly a good definition from Wikipedia. Um, it's an analysis term that refers to action of analyzing the attitudes of different stakeholders. Concept. Um, so you can go through these documents when you have some time. But I'm going to open up my presentation. <clears throat> okay, network mapping, the funnest thing to do. Uh, you can see this, no problem? Okay. Um, so we want networks. We want network-centric engagement. We want lots of leaders. We want self-organizing teams. We want uh, to expand rapidly. We want to be pretty efficient, and we want to be able to communicate um, and spread resources in all directions. We want to kind of create these, like, very... Uh, that share on their own, that lead on their own, that do their own thing. Um, and part of that, the first step to doing that is stakeholder mapping. Kind of the um, definition that we went through a little bit earlier. Um, we want to actually understand who is in the space and who is interested in doing the kinds of things we are doing. Um, what are their attitudes towards it? Who they are? What's their, what is their sort of um, take on the whole situation? We don't want to just tell people to do what we want them to do. We want to under, actually understand who people are that are participating and um, actually working with us in the future. So the first step is to, you know, find the stakeholders. Uh, how do we find stakeholders? What questions do we need to ask to find out who our stakeholders are? And I want everyone to sort of for a minute and, you know, pull out a piece of paper or open a document and kind of get a good idea. Okay, um, in terms of open data, sharing data skills, in terms of what we're doing um, in our areas, what kind of questions should we be kind of asking people? Um, who interested in data becoming more accessible? What are major events surrounding data in my area? So, for instance, in India, um, you know, we kind of look at, okay, who is interested in data? 
And there's obviously the tech community. They are making mobile apps. They're doing things with data. But there's also people like um, NGOs, CSOs on the ground who are using data to track their interventions, who um, are using it to help people uh, keep things like water quality, uh, create interventions. So those are people also interested in, in doing data uh, work. Um, and they also could be interested in making data more accessible. So when you talk to people, kind of have these questions in mind and say, like, what is your interest in data? What Are you interested in making it more accessible? Um, maybe they're kind of interesting. For instance, in India, there was just an election. And um, we want to actually engage with the government. The government has now become more interested in moving data forward, um, having better data collection. So there is actually a lot of conversations about how to improve uh, data collecting, um, accuracy. And so what is, can we engage in them in an open data conversation? Um, so kind of being in tune to what's happening around you. Um, and that helps you identify who is a good stakeholder and who isn't a good stakeholder. Um, you know, who can you continue to interact with? Nisha, I had a debate with somebody about um, the use of the word public and stakeholders. Um, okay. I'm wondering if you've had that conversation about stakeholders, because I think that um, I think that NGOs, and this really smacks hard for me, NGOs like to talk about the public or the people they're serving as something outside of the box and not in charge of, not part of the stakeholder um, what do you call it, package? They're not part of the decision-making process. Have you heard that before? I have not heard that specific thing, but I can, I think something similar to that kind of sentiment has been said to me. Sort mm -hmm. of like, we are in charge of packaging information for a certain group of people, and they might not necessarily participate in that packaging of information. Is that what you kind of mean? Um, sort of in terms of stakeholders and the people they serve not being stakeholders? I guess, um, potentially, I'll park it. I just, I, like, I think that when people talk about stakeholders, they, they kind of put things in silos, and I think that it's not so clear. But let's, let's right. just... Right. Uh, Which yeah. I think is, like, it's important to understand your goal and your mission, right? If we're, uh, if we're raising data capacity, um, citizens are included in that. And if you're going after citizens, you have to ask who, what kind of, how do I reach citizens? How do I do these types of things? Um, and, like, anyone can be a stakeholder. You can't really limit it. Stakeholder itself is kind of a term of people or groups that are interested in the common thing. Um, so, I think that's an interesting debate. We can come back to it. Um, in a bit. Okay, so you kind of have to keep asking these questions, keep a list of them, so that you get a good idea of um, who are you looking for and how are you finding them. So uh, I use this like matrix, like it's basically a table, um, and I'm actually going to show you my table. Uh, so basically anyone I meet, um, anyone who I've had a conversation with, uh, I ask different, these types of questions and I put them, um, they're arranged by city into these, um, into these tables. Just so I can go back to them, I know who's interested, I know what I'm doing, um, because I, and more interested in connecting certain players with other players uh, who are aligned. It's like when we were at summer camp and we were all doing this is what I want to learn and this is what I want to teach. And as a kind of um, stakeholder mapping exercise, you have to do that in a broader kind of way with the people you meet and to keep that in mind. Um, just so you know where kind of people are placed. So I kind of do, you know, who is the who is the, or who's the person, why are they interested in data, 
what kind of initiatives are they doing, where are they based, what is their particular expertise, what sector do they work in, what is their personal open data policy, uh, contacts, are they willing to be a sponsor for an event, and, you know, etc. And you don't have to fill out everything, it doesn't have to be this um, immaculate database, but it does help you when you're sort of um, going back and trying to understand um, who are the players, you know, you have a, a list ready. It's kind of contact management um, in its basic forms, but with these additional, you know, contextual ideas around them. Um, so I kind of want uh, right now for people to sort of take a kind of a moment and to start thinking about if you were going to build this type of table, what would you be interested? What would you be interested in knowing? Um, what kind of columns would you put in? Um, you know, obviously things like people who know a particular skill, uh, people who are willing to teach. Um, you know, interest in uh, you know just kind of these types. It should feed into the questions a little bit, um, and also go back to what we're essentially trying to do, which is extend the use and um, open data. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is kind of a next level is when you're trying to advocate or push something forward, what is the level of influence a particular stakeholder has? Um, and these are kind of who is important for decision making, for spreading words, for providing skills, uh, who can expand the community in a way. So when you are filling out your matrix, you can kind of get an idea, okay, um, I have met five reporters who are interested in building skills, and I know five people willing to teach skills, and it's good to have reporters around because they help spread the word. Um, or when you're trying to expand your audience the way I am right now, it's more like, okay, I actually want to work more with people who are not tech savvy, and that means I have to go and meet people, which means I have to know um, particular people who are bridges to that community and they're an influence to that community. For instance, in India it would be local language reporters, people who don't uh, operate in English only, and they can help bridge a gap between me and the communities I want to reach eventually. Um, so it's also uh, very important for us to take a moment um, and kind of after we've sort of figured out a handful of people, where do they sit on influence you want, whether you want to do advocacy, whether you want to Hey, Nisha, you're cutting out. Did she cut out for everybody or just me? All right, so um, I'm going to fake it. I'm going to do fake Nisha. So my chart had, um, I added I added two columns to the chart that I keep. One is um, what do these people want from the organization and what can I do to get buy-in. So somewhere in between that decision making and as you're building forward, those are what, that's what my kind of chart has. And this is how, and Ulu has been, hi, hi Frederick. Uh, this is how Ulu knows um, if you're sharing, is that Hannah? Hannah's got Frederick's picture. No, it's Frederick. Um, Ulu, that's how I connect you with different people. So what kind of questions do you, uh, <laughs> of course he did. Uh, it, um, what questions do you ask when you're thinking about how to negotiate with people? Nobody. I can't even turn her screens for her. If you go to, let's see, I'm going to open up her slides. She was on, let me put their slides back in. <clears throat> she said that her, her network connectivity might die, which would be super interesting. Here we go. Here's her slides. And let's see. 
So if you go to slide seven, she says, what is the best way for you to involve a particular state stakeholder? So do you do workshops, do you do meetings, do you give information? And I think, I think that, that really depends. For me, um, I don't, you can't ask somebody to come to a workshop without actually having some pre-conversations with them, especially if they hate the word open data. If you're going to talk about open data, like that's, that's, that's not something that's totally accessible for folks. So you have to figure out how you're going to have a pre-conversation before you bring people to a meeting or if you're asking them to sponsor your event, you have to have pre-conversations. I'd say almost up to two years before you can get people to do things in Canada. I don't know what it's like in other countries, but it's a long long process to get people to feel like they're going to be part of something. Um, so what, what, what's the best way that you think you work with to get particular stakeholders involved in your work? I'm going to play Bueller. Can anyone answer this while we wait for Nisha? So uh, we did something a little bigger where we had the, a big unconference um, and invited a government uh, open society and NGOs and, and corporates. And for the people that came, it was pretty successful to get buy-in, uh, mostly because a lot of them had their peers there, that some of whom had done stuff already. Um, so for instance, one government department would talk about their open data strategy, and the next government department would kind of be encouraged by what they saw um, and, and be more open to open data after that. So. I think uh, what, what, even what Nisha was saying about uh, finding people to connect to other people. Um, uh, I think identifying uh, organizations and their peers, some, one that, some that have started open, done the open data uh, path and some who haven't, and then trying to put them together, I think that could be quite powerful. Oops. Heather, you're muted. There we go. So at your own conference, did you do any kind of speed dating? Did you match people who have like skills and, and who are new or not new? Did you match them together? How did you uh, do that? Did, but I think if we were to do it again, we probably would do something like that. I think that would be re really good. Um, that kind of happened naturally, almost, um, because uh, people, you know, with unconference format, people uh, put up their their topics, and so the, the people who were in, you know, tended to be interested in a certain topic would go to a certain group, and that's how uh, I think uh, uh, caused caused people to connect, and um, just because they were of a certain interest. But I think a deep speed dating kind of format would also work really well. Yeah. One of my um, one of my mentors, what he does is um, he calls it ally training. So before mm -hmm. an event, he he uh, he runs Mozfest, and so before an event, he'll have and Friedrich knows him is is Gunner. Like he will run um, a large room of people who are pre pre trained on here's some of the topics, here's some of the buzz we need, here's some of the, yeah I know I'm a huge Gunner fan. Um, here's some of the topics, here's some of the things we need. Can you um, find strangers, get them involved, ask some questions, be a leader, and so he'll like ramp you up in that conversation. So. The first time I did this with him was about five years ago, and now I know every single event that I will find like ten people, and I will have a conversation before that, and I'll say, "Listen, I need you to do this." And so then you then you have all these people who are supercharged to kind of be your ambassadors in rooms, and so you always have like who's organizing the event, but then you have all these other pseudo volunteers who are just dispatched to try and try and do a little bit of matchmaking. And so that that in itself has kind of infused most of my events to help new stakeholder new people feel like they're part of the building rather than and giving them a little bit more age I hate the word agency but to use the word agency. Um, one thing that we've done at Crisis Mappers Conference is try and figure out and Ulu has been there um, is try and figure out how to um, how to make sure that new people to crisis mapping and to that network feel like they're involved because we're a group of friends who are online all the time and we know each other but you add another like 50 to 70 people who've never been around us how do you get them involved in it so it's super super hard to figure out We did not get Nisha back. All right, so I'm gonna fake. I'm gonna play fake Nisha. Okay, so we're on slide seven. Okay, so on slide eight, she says, find out their needs. What can they give? So it's part of the matrix. What can people do? What do they need? And what can they provide? Is their capacity, skills, ideas, and spaces to be heard? And so I guess um, 
like in, I have this chart as well. So like this idea of like how do you how do you do that kind of like virtual matchmaking for people? But I think it's important to be able to figure out um, figuring out what what their kind of uh, on ramp is. Nisha, we got to slide eight. How are you doing? Are you back? Uh, I'm on my 3G. The power hasn't come back yet, uh, but um, I can kind of um, answer a few questions if there are any, and sure. we can just if you guys can see the slideshow, then I can keep going. Is that possible? Yeah. Super. So we got to slide eight. Um, Jason and I kind of navigated through. So um, okay. I don't. Uh, did anybody have any questions for Nisha about slide seven and slide eight? Happy had a question about global events. I don't know if we, if I answered it, which I didn't. Um, if we want to go back a little, go ahead. little bit. Um, uh, global events to go to for networking. Um, I think global events are really powerful for networking. In, I don't um, have a good quality list in my head right now, uh, but there's usually um, kind of a few uh, that always turn up. Um, OK Fest is always one of them. Transparency Camp, um, and. Uh, they're usually really good, but again, keep your audience in mind. You don't want to spend a lot of time trotting the globe if you're trying to do specific stuff in a specific area. Like, I don't go to a lot of global events because it's important to just travel India and make sure that I'm kind of hitting my base here. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but I think um, we can kind of keep a list of really good, solid networking events somewhere and see uh, how we feel about the pros and cons of each of them for our specific needs and organizations, um, if that makes sense. Uh, okay, so hey, Nisa, slide, yeah. Nisa, I've, got, I've got a list of, of global events that I, I kind of oh, attend. Awesome. Um, but I think I think all of us, as you said, um, you know, if there's something that's global, that's a lot of investment in getting your organization to pay for it. Super hard getting a scholarship, you know, competitive. So having having a master list of events that relate to School of Data, that's a great action point. So happy, I'll write that down for sure. Um, I think that I think that I would add Mozfest to that. I really would. Um, I think mm. that you know it's open source and there's a component of open data, but you also get to learn some tactics and tools from other leaders. Um, I would also add, uh, we were talking earlier about Personal Democracy Forum. I really think that's a great place to be. Um, but I'm happy to add those in part for later and share a list with people and put in the network drive. I think that's really a good idea. And I think, you know, strategically it does make sense to go to at least a few of them or have, like, I have a policy in our group that um, I don't go to them, but other people in the group who don't usually get the opportunity to go, get to go because it's really, to feel connected to a global community is important, and I think having a good list of where is a really awesome networked place, like OK Fest, um, would be really valuable to certain people in, in your group. Um, I would use that, so I think that's a really good action point. Okay, bah, 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 bah. Uh, so slide eight. Um, okay. Uh, so, find out what their needs and what they uh, what they give. So, that's exactly what we did in summer uh, camp, which is okay. Who who wants to learn something? Who who can learn? Who can teach something? Um, I think the trick to this is that sometimes people don't really understand what they need. Um, they might think they need technical support, but what they actually need is a space to sort of understand their problem um, in a broader sense and come up with different types of solutions. Um, so it's important when stakeholder mapping to sort of understand that when someone is all like, I need a mobile app for something, they might actually not. They just don't know how to tackle their problem anymore, and they keep hearing about new tools. Um, so 
it might just be really valuable to kind of create spaces where people can sort of talk about their issues with different types of other people. So um, that's where the stakeholder matrix is actually really helpful because if you can get a diverse group together, um, then sort of brainstorming and coming up with new ideas um, and then, you know, coming up with the space to, and in coming up with enough people invested in the problem to actually solve it is really, um, is really key. And then you are no longer on providing support. They are all supporting each other. Um, and, and this is when you start becoming actually a community, is when you're pulling people together and you're identifying what are needs and what people are actually trying to um, do with people who want to help them. Um, whether they're exactly what they need or not. You're just creating enough spaces for people to constantly talk about the stuff that they're doing. Eventually, really good solutions will come out of it. Um, two, two, two. Okay, slide nine. Who should be connected? Um, so as a node or the center of your network, you work to connect people. Um, and like I, I, I have like a personal motto. It's like my only job is to build trust. It's not to grow, uh, you know, you know, get Facebook hits or Twitter followers. It's not to do all the, like those numbers are important. But if people don't trust uh, me as a person, that I'll be honest and that I'll be straightforward and that I'll connect people, um, which I think in a productive manner, then I'm not doing my job really well. So uh, through all this, like the network building, the stakeholder mapping, you're building relationships and communicating with people. So it's important to always be um, a trusted person. And that will actually bring more people to want to involve you in different aspects of their work. Um, always keep in mind, uh, what are the politics between groups? Like People don't get along um, for various reasons. So it's always good to kind of know even though two groups might really need each other, they might not be ready to get along. Um, and so sometimes a moderate force is sort of necessary um, and kind of keeping that in mind. Um, Nisha, I would, and also I your would, own personal, yeah, go ahead. I would add Please? a couple Go ahead. Would, yeah, it's Heather. Yeah. I would add a couple of things. One, you know, if you spent so much time trying to build those relationships, it becomes very attractive for people to want your network and to potentially ask for ask for introductions and use those sparingly. Um, I found over the years that I'm really careful with who I trust with my network and who I introduce people to. Um, and it's not because I don't want to introduce the world and don't want to connect people because I really truly do. But I think it's important that people feel like you're um, legitimate in your actions. So um, one thing is always, if you're introducing somebody, always ask in advance. Like send a note saying, hey, can I introduce you to the so-and-so? Especially if it's a couple levels up, um, it's a sign of respect. And it's also respect of their time to say, you know what, do you want to help this person? But if you're, if you're mentoring somebody or if you're guiding somebody, it's always kind of good to, um, to let them know that, you know, I've got to ask first. Um, but let me yeah. let me know. Like the, I'll give you, I'll get I'll open the door for you, but I gotta ask first, right? And so mm -hmm. make sure that and this is how you should manage that and help them help them manage that relationship too, so that it kind of widens the circle of trust. Does that make sense? And yes, so, absolutely. I'm really, so I'm super careful with stakeholders on that. And I think that um, when you say it's about trust, I think that people change their minds too. Um, mm -hmm. I've been in That's conversations. I've been people change their minds on who they trust and who they want to work with. And and just being really kind of tuned in to what kind of the social politics is around it. So not even who doesn't get along, but just being aware of, well, you know, X person doesn't like when X person is funding. And it's like, oh, gosh, what a nightmare. I don't want to play that game. But at the same time, being aware of your stakeholders and their interplay is good. Um, those are all really, really good points, Heather. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um yeah, I mean, w w what we really are doing is being, like, very conscious. Man, did we just lose M Nisha again? Nisha, are you muted? Listen, Happy's got a question. 
let's see if somebody can answer this question while we get Nisha back. She said, in terms of open data in relation to open governance, she sort of wants to know where to go and where to look. She's really stumped in terms of how to get um, those people involved. So how do you find stakeholders? And I think at the beginning, Happy Misha was talking about um, kind of building your own index of who does what in your area, your local area, and then kind of asking for asking for input. So for example, yesterday you were asking about, you know, who does offline or online open data in the Philippines that you know about or in examples. And so I knew somebody um, who does open street map work there. So I think it's also asking your network, but I, I've I've built whole events pushing something onto Twitter, believe it or not. I know it sounds nuts, but you know I got three thousand dollars in funding and it was for Haiti crisis response and I built a network just by asking questions. And so being a little scrappy, asking questions can probably probably do that a little bit. I'm not saying you'll raise that much money for an event, but I think it was a pretty special case. But asking asking people and finding the right people to ask might be the way to go about it. Um, finding somebody who can help you navigate um, in your country, Happy, I think is super important. Nisha, I just answered Happy's question online. Please go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry. I um, uh, My power came back, so... It's a happy day. Um, okay, let me share my screen again. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, what I was saying is that we're really kind of, um, we're social instruments that we have to be finely tuned, um, sort of. Is that look at it? Um, and then the last point is how much are you willing to take on as a facilitator? It's actually quite a lot of work hurting people. It's like hurting cats. Um, so just be aware of uh, how much you want to do in terms of that role. Um, connecting people is great, uh, but also sometimes they need uh, people to kind of take them forward the first five steps. Um, maybe the whole way. So just being really aware of your own limits um, is really powerful because it also feeds back to trust. You don't want to promise too much to be able to deliver and then people are kind of, like, their apathy sort of grows about around, like, the community you're trying to build. Um, so being really honest with expectations is also really important. I think, I think what I do as well is I'm really transparent, Nisha. So I'm mm -hmm. like, I've got five hours that I'm giving OpenStreetMap this week. That's all you guys are getting. So if you want me to do this, I'm going to do this. But that's how much time I have to give based on my own life cycles or whatever. So if you're really clear on time and effort, I think that, that shows um, shows it. But also telling people how long things take, I think that that's that's a good socialization. You know, it, For example, Skillshare is on average six hours from everything about it, right? Like doing one of these, about six hours of work, right? So just like being really clear on, on what the tasks are, I think helps people understand that, hey, you're not, you're, not, you're not just donating your time to build your network or build your stakeholders. You're actually, there's a lot of work involved. Yeah, and, and you're, a community and network is basically you're building enough trust between people to kind of create a sense of obligation and maybe obligation is kind of a strong word, but you want people to be like, I am going to do something um, also. And you have to be really clear that that's what we're doing. You have to also. Um, which I think, in terms of School of Data, you know, that, that's that been pretty clear. I have to feel like, yeah, we have to participate in what is our, what is our roles and what are we doing. We have to add knowledge. We have to do all these things. And it's a pretty good model, like for us and our individual networks going forward. Um, any questions? I haven't been looking at the hangout, so uh, I got you sorted. I got you sorted. That's my uh, my thing. Okay, cool. Um, okay. And uh, the last slide is just rinse and repeat. You never stop doing this. Um, it's never something that um, is done. You're like, oh, I've I've made my matrix, I've made my PPT, I've drawn my circles, and it's finished. No, you're always adding people. There's always new people. Like, people change their minds. There's new people. There's, like, events change. Things shift. Um, you know, India's a good example. We are now have a new government. We've spent a lot of time building really good 
strong connections with the last government and now they're all gone and we have to recreate and rebuild all our new connections with this new government who have completely different um, opinions and are a completely different stakeholder. Um, so you never feel like this is something that um, that but it should not the burden up on you should be a little bit less every time you do it there should be more people helping you do it so that's also a part of it is training people to also become stakeholder mappers in your community uh, whether they're keeping the spreadsheet or not but to like identify this is a good person this is like this is someone we need um, or this is someone we should be aware of this is kind of a negative person like always being aware um, of the people around you is really important um, so I like to say yeah, go on. Nisha, I like to say it's my job to put myself out of a job and have more people doing it. And the more yeah. I put myself out of a job, the better the network is. Um, Jason had a question. Do you want to voice that, Jason, or you just, or should I read that? I can go to the Hangout now. Blah, 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 blah. Here, I'll read it for him. Um, yeah. Nisha, can you give a perfect personal example of when you use something, when when you used your network for something? When I used my network for something? So uh, when DataMe was still fairly new, we um, the open data platform came into existence. Um, and it came out of nowhere. Like no one saw it coming. But we were a community that existed for open data, and now we had an open data platform. So through like the network, we were able to get several meetings with the governing, um, the policy body, the Department of Science and Technology, to give them feedback on the open data policy. And then we were able to then just connect with the implementing body, which is the National Info Information uh, Center, and help them implement data.gov.in. Um, and that was all through kind of keeping very um, aware of who knows who in the network. Um, so we were able to, we gave them a list of standards for data that we think are important. We were able to work with them on various workshops with all these things. And that was just kind of serendipity. We were a group that existed and then we were able to kind of take advantage of an event that happened. Um, and in the end, we have a fairly good data portal. Um, there's, and we have a very good relationship with that team. Um, and so we can request, go, like, and through them, we actually got the census data open. So it actually worked. It's like a continuous kind of um, feedback um, loop. Because they need us, too. They don't have a lot of internal support. So they need it to be a demand-driven platform. And that's what we were for them. Um, so that's kind of a very personal, kind of our biggest win through our network. Um, and we we sort of um, and we push more people into that relationship. Like I don't meet with them as often as the people who we brought, we bring more people into them. They meet with them, they meet with more people. And then we don't have to govern it as much. It's so that they're constantly meeting with people who need this portal. Um, and we are, our job is just to send more people over there and say, go meet with them. They will help you get data. Um, and that's sort of how we utilize this network for open data. How long did it take you, Nisha, to do the spreadsheet that you had? Like, so, so I say some, like, some of the stuff that I've started working on four, four or five years ago is starting to come forward. How long do you think it normally takes? Like, just, just a ballpark on, like, so let's say that some of our newer fellows have, don't have a state, stakeholder spreadsheet and they're about to start planning their network and planning their outreach. How, what, how long does it take to kind of build that? I know that's kind of an obtuse question because every country is different. But just to kind of frame it as to this is a long-term thing. I think the spreadsheet where it is right now, it's taken about two and a half years. Um, but it, I mean, 
that's just because that's how long sometimes it takes to meet people. It's not necessarily, um, and India is actually, despite its size, kind of small. Uh, there's only so many people working in a particular space. So you actually, at the end, when I, like about, I started actually writing everything down about a year ago. So actually when I started writing everything down, I like uh, realized that I had hit most organizations at some point, And now we're just going back and making sure that it's in a more systematic way. And then I'm kind of seeing um, who else is there and who else haven't we talked to. Um, and since we have a pretty good idea of who we have, so that that has been sort of the last year, kind of working towards building it in a particular type of way. But it, it I mean, it takes a little, it takes a little bit um, of time to sort of understand who you know, and then how you should keep meeting people and what kind of people. So I've got three questions then. Um, two from other people, one from me, I'll, and I think you almost answered it. So. Um, you have a wish list in your stakeholder mapping as well, right? Like the people you want to meet in the future, the people you want to plan to meet. That's part of your strategy, right? Yes. Um, well, yeah. It, the, the, the people I know and the people I wish to meet, sometimes I don't know I want, uh, who I wish to meet. I have yeah. a big, yeah. vague idea of this kind of profile of a person. That's right. Um, I want to have coffee you, with Joy Ito, but you know, first I have to like go to MIT and you know those things. So Jason had a question: Should we keep yes. it secret and personal, or shared with your organization? Um, I think that's up to you, really. Um, it depends on your columns, also. I don't necessarily share this with everyone, just because I have columns like willing to work with person and you know it's like no or yes or like you know um, will this person be sponsors is this person an open data person and that's not necessarily something that should be really public but if you have a list that isn't where you don't have like a personal opinion on these people in, in such a structured way then go ahead and share um, there's nothing wrong with that, I think we have a uh, fairly public list of sponsors that have sponsored our events and done all these things, and you know that's been perfectly fine. But if you are doing a pretty detailed stakeholder mapping with like who gets along with who and who doesn't and who is like not open, to it, then I wouldn't I wouldn't really share it beyond a trusted. Um, so it's kind of how I feel about it. Um, Do you see the next question from Cordina? Are cool. the meetings between government people and civil society on a regular basis? Uh, the, we have a Delhi chapter that meets with the uh, government fairly often. Um, uh, and there are people who are in the network whose job is to meet with the government fairly often and we try to get them to report back. As a network, do we meet with the government fairly often? Mm, no, but we do interact with them in a court. So for instance, when we did an open data camp in March, elections, we invited a former government people, we invited former government people, and then we wrote a letter and we're like, the election commission should redo their data, and we sent them a letter. Um, so we do things like that, and we send emails to people and such, but not, I wouldn't say monthly or even maybe yearly, we'll make sure we have a meeting, um, but we leave it to the chapters and to the group to sort of keep that relationship going. Do you, um, do you monitor them? So your stakeholders, do you keep, like, keep tabs on them? And so, for example, if one of my stakeholders, um, like, if one of them does something really great, I send them like, hey, that was a great article or whatever. Like, I just kind of manage that relationship. Do you do you have, like, um, alerts on people? How do you manage that piece, Misha? Uh, we do have alerts on certain organizations, um, like people who do a lot of policy work. Um, but we don't, we don't do a lot of monitoring of the network itself. Uh, we do encourage people 
to report to the larger list doing what their projects are, how they've been going. And usually people are fairly um, are fairly good about sharing their successes. They're not usually really good at sharing their failures. I think going forward we would want to kind of manage um, and keep track of things a little bit more. Um, but so far we haven't and we have our primary way of doing it through these meetups and these chapters is to kind of have people come together and give presentations and work on what they're doing but not in like a systematic sort of way. I think that would be a good next step for us. Very cool. Nisha, thanks so much for, for all the information and all the resources. Does anybody else have any other last closing questions? If not, then we can uh, close energy. Do you have other closing comments, uh, Ms. Nisha? No. I uh, Thanks, everyone. I think um, that these are, these are like, me anytime if you need help. It's one of my favorite things to do. I think it's because I'm, like, really nosy, but it's, like, just <laughs> one of my... I think it's really... I think the reason I do this is because I like interacting with lots of different types of people and this is one of the things that um, gets me really excited about community organizing and doing these things. So please feel free to ask me for help or to do it anytime because I, you know, I love it. I have everything to do. So that's all. Thanks again, Nisha, for sharing everything. And I will, um, I will source the video and I will put a blog post up with it, with all the resources. Um, and if you have any other questions, by all means, go to the network list. And um, Nisha, have a great day, and everybody else as well. Thanks. Okay.